What is hexagonal architecture? Long time ago, Alistair Cockburn was working on a project when the team responsible to build an object relational mapper, yes, we have to build those things in the past. They told him that they would need to do a major refactor, they will basically need to rebuild everything. So it would be better for the team to take just a few weeks off and get back once they have that ready. That sounds ridiculous, right? But that is the origin story of many of the architecture styles that we use nowadays. The story of when hexagonal architecture became a thing. So in this video, I'll tell you what hexagonal architecture is, why it works, and why you should give it a chance. But first, let me tell you what used to happen before we had hexagonal architecture. When I started programming, the three-layered architecture was the thing. But even nowadays, it's quite popular and we are in 2024. The three-layered architecture can be explained quite simply. We have basically three main layers. One that is responsible for all the codes that represents your presentation layer. So here you will find anything that your user will interact with, things like a UI, for example. Then you will have a layer that is responsible to hold all the important logic of your application, things like the business rules. And last but not least, at the bottom, you will find anything that is regarding data, the data infrastructure layer. So this is the famous lasagna in software development, but this type of architecture brings some problems. Since the dependencies go from the upper layers to the layers on the bottom, you will create a lot of coupling that is hard to manage. And that will bring you a lot of problems to test your system. Having tests running in isolation will be quite challenging. And this is basically what happened to Halister. When you have the upper layers depending on the layers on the bottom, you create such dependency that any change on the bottom will have ripple effects on the layers up. And it's quite hard to keep working on the layers above without the layer below. And with this incident, Alistair realized that every system has mainly two parts. One of them is the inside of the application and the other one is the outside. The inside is the most important part of your application. Is all the logic, is everything that you are doing special. Is the special source of your application. And on the outside, you have an unpredictable world that you need to deal with. You have dependencies that start changing versions, that you don't control them, that you can't address the issues for them. They might be up, they might be down. There's a lot of unpredictable things. And that raises the question, how can we protect our internal world from the crazy world out there? So Alistair realized that when your code is interacting with a database, it in fact follows the same pattern as interacting with an API. So that means that you have the possibility of creating a contract that will work as an abstraction for the technology that is on the other side. Because the utilization patterns of those technologies is kind of like the same. And to this contract, we call them the ports. So now that you have that contract, that port, you can connect to any type of technology that you want. The only thing that you need to do is to implement a simple adapter that will convert the things from the contract into the desired technology. This adapter will be kind of like a translation layer. So you can have multiple adapters fulfilling the same port, the same contract, independently on the way that they work. And it's due to those names, ports and adapters, that hexagonal architecture is also known as ports and adapters. So if we have those ports, we can put them on the edges of our special source of our core application to protect that core application from the outside world. And if we need to write theta into, for example, MySQL, we just need to plug an adapter that knows the contract and converts that contract into SQL statements for MySQL. And we can do exactly the same to other technologies. As an example, you can store files on S3, Azure Blob Storage, FTP, whatever. As far as you implement an adapter that translates the contract into the operations needed to put the file there, you can do it. But then he came to the conclusion that we not only have these type of adapters that are reacting to things that we do with our application, we have other types of adapters as well. So we split our adapters in two groups. One is those that we have seen, that we call them the driven adapters or secondary adapters. That is basically adapters that our application will use to produce something. But also we have driving adapters or primary adapters. And those can be anything that will interact with our application to perform a given task. 
As an example, it might be an API request, it might be a UI, it might be a mobile application, it might be a message handler reacting to a message from Kafka. And this model of the ports and adapters is what makes a new change compared to what we used to have with the three-layered architecture. Because now, even that the flow of control is still the same, a request comes through the UI, goes through the logic, and then goes to a given infrastructure resource, and we reply back, so the flow is the same, the dependency rule is different. So dependencies will point inward. That means that our hexagon is not aware of anything that goes outside. It just knows that it has some contracts with the outside and then we can plug in anything into there. So you can have all your logic completely isolated from the outside world. I know that you are asking why an hexagon? The answer is quite simple. Alistair was looking for a shape that was not commonly used. And the most used one when you are building diagrams of a system is boxes. So he wanted something different and he landed into an hexagon. And the funny part is that nowadays hexagons are quite a thing. We represent microservices with hexagons. We even found some inspiration in Edicoms to describe how we build software nowadays. Hexagonal architecture is my favorite style. Why? Because as far as you respect the simplicity of it, it will work because the concept is simple and easy to understand. It will naturally invite you to start working in what matters. So you start by your logic, your hexagon. By doing so, you are delaying important decisions until a moment where you have more information. As an example, picking the correct type of data store for a given problem. It also doesn't impose you a lot of rules. What is a good thing? So do you want to go with domain-driven design? You can do it. Do you want to slice your application into features? you can do it. As far as you respect the basic rules of hexagonal architecture, you can do whatever you want. So you don't need to struggle to follow a given convention, a given pattern to address each problem. It's not as other styles of architecture that every single thing needs to go through a given flow, through a given set of layers, until the moment that it doesn't make a lot of sense to some types of requests. With hexagonal, you don't have that. Other excellent reason to use Hexagonal architecture is testability. Hexagonal is designed with testing in mind. Why? Because you can test in isolation. Your Hexagon can be tested without a dependency on external technologies. So that makes the tests easy to maintain, they are not flaky and they are quite fast to run. All of that due to this abstraction by design that Hexagonal applies. So if you test everything through the edges, so through the ports, you are sure that you will start testing through the contracts and contracts are stable while every single thing that is inside of that hexagon might change because they are implementation details. So it leads you in a good direction. There's even a rule that I like to use with hexagonal architecture that is one port, two adapters. That means that for each port, you should have at least two adapters. One with implementation that you want to have by the end, and another one for testing. And another reason to use exact architecture is tool independence. This aspect makes every single technology that you depend, anything from the outside world, easy to swap. And I know that it's quite rare to change technologies like a database. It's quite rare to do it. However, let me give you a few reasons why even then this is still a good idea. In the past, I used to work at a company where in the beginning of a given service that we had to build, we decided to go with the data technology that we were familiar with. But eventually with the scale, with the amount of data that we had to ingest every single day, we start having problems. So things took too long to, to execute. So we had to pick another data technology that would address those problems that we were living with. And the fact that all the code accessing to the database was in an adapter made the process quite simple. There were still some changes to the contracts, to the ports. However, they were quite small. So the way that I would like to see it is that it might not be that common, but it's like an insurance. And it's an insurance that will quickly pay off when you are testing. Because when you are testing, you are basically swapping the technology that you use in production with a test double. It can be a fake, it can be a mock, whatever. So in fact, you already swap technologies for the sake of testing. And one more reason to consider exacting architecture is the fact that nowadays it's quite common to rely on clean architecture for everything. However, not always it is the best option. 
And in fact, hexagonal architecture is in the roots of clean architecture. And if you don't believe me, make sure you take a look into this video to find the real essence of clean architecture.